The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well being of older Californians and their caregivers. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Wadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, I am so excited for today. We have a super, very special guest with us. Super, very special guest. We have Linda Freed, who is a geriatrician, a famous geriatrician, um, one of our celebrities. Um, she is uh, formerly was a chair at Hopkins and is now at Columbia, where she's director of the Robert Butler Aging Center and dean of the School of Public Health. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. I'm so happy to be here. I am excited to talk about frailty. It is something as a geriatrician, I'm still trying to get my head around, which I, I feel like I shouldn't be acknowledging that as a geriatrician, but it is still something I'm trying to get my head around. But before we go into the topic of frailty, Linda, do, do you have a song request for Alex? So I think the song du jour, certainly the song of the year, uh, goes back to Bob Dylan because the times are changing. Accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone If your time to you is worth saving Then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone For the times they are a-changing That was awesome, Alex. So I'd love to like take a big step in time and just think about how... You are a guru, like the it person when it comes to like frailty. How did you get interested in this as a subject? I got interested in it because I became a geriatrician. And as a newly trained geriatrician, I was told that frailty was the raison d'etre of geriatric medicine. And uh, that seemed important. And I started reading what there was because I was looking at people who seemed frail to me. And the literature said that I would know it when I saw it and that everybody else knew it when they saw it. But we couldn't put really uh, a name to it beyond that. And in fact, the more I saw patients, the more I wasn't really comfortable that the definitions I saw matched my patients. So there was a lot of, at, at the time, and the, this was in the late 80s, you, if you looked at the publications of the National Institute on Aging, they said frailty was the same as ADL disability. Well, I saw people who seemed frail to me but were not ADL disabled. So that didn't work for me. Um, and there was a lot of really innovative work going on to establish geriatric assessment as a leading modality of, of geriatric care, uh, evaluation and care. And in fact, I, I set up and directed a, the Geriatric Assessment Center at Hopkins and was seeing a lot of very complicated patients and was deeply interested in the literature that was coming out from David Rubin and many others about evaluating geriatric assessment clinics. And I led one. And the puzzling thing to me, as I eagerly looked forward to their reporting the results of their randomized trials in geriatric assessment, the thing that was really disturbing was that I knew it made a difference what we were doing made a difference. I led a large multidisciplinary team. We were seeing highly complicated patients. I thought that our evaluations really mattered in terms of figuring out what was going on with those patients and how to intervene. And the clinical trials were repeatedly coming out negative. Negative meaning they said that all of that investment of brain power and resources didn't matter. That concerned me because it didn't, again, it didn't match what I ex saw clinically. And, and so I probably went down a, a deep rabbit hole of trying, reading everything I could to try and figure out why this was. And what 
really emerged for me was that the way people were being selected into geriatric assessment, the way um, the criteria for who was frail um, didn't match from one trial to another, from one center to another. Hmm. And in fact, was a grab bag of everything that could possibly occur with aging. So in general, the criteria for frailty, and I'm putting that in quotation marks here, was all the things that that geriatricians are so important for. Multimorbidity, the very old, old, disability, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, along a whole continuum. And all of those and more were in the grab bag of who was being characterized as frail, and the trials were showing no difference. So, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to look at that and say, well, maybe we have a targeting problem. Um, <laughs> maybe we need to figure out who, re- if we're showing no difference that, and we're just using this modality for everybody, Maybe we have to learn how to be more sophisticated about saying who this expensive um, clinical investment really benefits. And so that was my starting point in thinking about frailty, trying to say, well, do we need to understand who is frail better so that we can really be more meticulous about matching the clinical intervention to the patient? Yeah. And I feel like, first of all, like the, the frailty, I feel like nowadays I see a new paper about frailty, like like every time I open up a JAGS uh, publication, but like even, you know, going back to, I just pulled up the PubMed numbers, you know, there is less than a hundred publications, you know, around 2003 around frailty. Now we have like 1500 a year on frailty. So really hot topic right now. But, um, you know, I feel like there's still this idea when we're defining frailty, it, it's kind of like the, the pornography definition. Like, you know, when you see it. And I know there's a lot of other, including you, have defined frailty. I, I wonder if you can kind of give us a big kind of step back. How should we be thinking currently about how we define frailty? Well, let me, maybe I can start out by saying how I try to explore this because I went in agnostic in the sense that I didn't know the definition. I just knew that I was seeing patients who met what the the late 1980s literature said the concept of frailty was about, which is that they were people who were very vulnerable in the face of stressors, at very high risk of things going wrong. Sometimes I looked at them and, you know, they passed the visual sniff test, if you will, that they you know, you just looked at them, you just knew these were people who were vulnerable. And sometimes you only knew it when a stressor happened, like a, a, an accident or the flu, and everything fell apart, much more so than it would have you would have expected with another patient. So um, I started out without a predisposition as to what the answer in this was. I just knew that there were there were people who who were frail. <laughs> um, and I didn't know why or, or whether there was a way to identify them. And I went through uh, years of trying to figure out how to get there. I used to talk to, you know, like any geriatrician, you get invited to give lots of talks to people in assisted living facilities and nursing homes. And so I would always say to them, do you know anybody who's frail? Everybody always raised their hand in the audience and said, yes, they knew someone who was frail. It was never them. It was somebody else that they knew. (laughs) And and then I'd say, well, how do you know they're frail? And interestingly, they always said the same things. It wasn't one thing, but there was a repertoire of answers that people, older adults in assisted living facilities and nursing homes said, told them someone was frail. And it was that they were thin, they were weak, they were slow, they were tired, and perhaps they lost weight. Now, they no 
person would say all of those. But if I was talking to an audience of 50 people, those were the things I would hear. And I would hear it from, from these older adults who were themselves at risk of frailty over and over and over again, probably, you know, hundreds of times in all the different talks I gave. And then we did studies. Um, some of them I partnered with my fellow Jeff Williamson. And we did a series of studies asking um, geriatricians across many medical centers what they thought frailty was. And interestingly, what we learned, some of which is published and some of which nobody would ever publish, was that geriatricians didn't think frailty was the same as disability, even though that was the assumption, that they thought frailty was a distinct entity that they didn't think frailty was the same as disease, in fact. And there was no disease that was the same as frailty, but that there were some shared sequelae of diseases, of some diseases, which told a clinician they were frail. And interestingly, the sequelae that they identified as giving clues of frailty were consistent with what the people in the system assisted living facilities said they recognize this frailty. So that's, that's how I started out trying to understand this was, and then of course, studying my own patients and trying to see if I could glean some consistent principles. And my consistent principles came out to be pretty aligned with what the older adults were saying um, in terms of my own recognition. So that was where I started. And then I, I spent, honestly, eight years puzzling over the list that older adults gave me through all those talks, you know, that they kept saying the same five things over and over again that told one or another that somebody was frail. And I kept thinking, why on earth are these five things ending up in the same list? And I spent one day a week for eight years trying to figure this out. I read everything I could possibly read. I, uh, and then one day I saw at least what, for me, started to put it together, which was actually those five things which were isolated things on a list actually have a physiologic explanation of fitting into a clinical vicious cycle because we actually know uh, at that time, we knew there were pairwise connections between each of those things on that list. For example, if people, be, we, first of all, we knew that sarcopenia was a core anchoring component of both aging and frailty, that somehow this thing that was first described by Shakespeare of, <laughs> of a shrunk shank associated with getting older, that this thing which we now call sarcopenia of aging was a, a defining attribute of being frail. And it's you know beyond common knowledge to say when people get sarcopenia, they get muscle weakness and they become weaker. And when they're weaker, they actually slow down. And loss of muscle mass also diminishes exercise tolerance and fitness, right? And all of those things actually together predict disability. They're not the same as disability, but they predict who's going to become disabled. And altogether, they also predict people cutting back on their physical activity. And we actually know, even in the late 80s, there was really important work going on, particularly at Tufts, um, that showed that in a subset of older adults who may well be frail, for some reason, in that situation, people don't regulate tightly the balance between how much energy they're putting out in physical activity and how much they're taking in in their diet, it gets dysregulated. We count on that <laughs> to be <laughs> homeostatically balanced that we just will automatically not be fluctuating wildly in our weight every day from day to day to day because we tightly regulate this. But in a subset of older adults, it, the, dis, the dysregulation gets profound and even when people are, have very little physical activity, they're taking in even less nutritionally. And, and, and these five key components, so weakness, low walking speed, low physical activity, low energy or exhaustion and weight loss, is this what people usually describe as like phenotypic frailty? 
Well, that's the conclusion I came to, was that that not only uh, did geriatricians recognize these elements, one or another of them, as marking people who might be frail, but that physiologically they actually are linked. And clinically, it seems like when they had a lot of those things, they were worse off than when they had only one or two. So what I did was to then take a deep dive trying to figure out the science that could explain what I, what we were seeing clinically. And in fact, ended up with evidence that we're looking at a, a phenotypic group of a clinical syndrome, right? We're used to think about angina as a clinical syndrome, right? That's a no-brainer. Uh, constant, what's the medical definition of a clinical syndrome, a constellation of symptoms and signs that co-occur in a cluster. And when there's a cluster present, gives you an indication of a, so a pathophysiologic specificity of something going wrong in the body that results in that cluster, right? I wasn't reading that, so I was improvising a little bit, but that's, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but that's basically the medical dictionary definition of a clinical syndrome. And in fact, what we're looking at here is similarly a cluster of symptoms and signs that when they co-occur in a group, help mark something going on physiologically in that person, which produces that cluster of symptoms and signs. And what we've gone on to do is to show actually that that follows the characteristics of a clinical syndrome, that in fact, there's an underlying physiologic explanation for what's happening and biologic explanation for what's happening, which is what you would need to know if you really believe that this phenotype mattered. I guess, you know, again, taking another step back, thinking about kind of this definition, I feel like when I also open up that JAGS article, I, I often see like sometimes a, like a collection of different things that people call frailty that doesn't look like this. It may be like an index of a lot of different like lab values and other markers, which often looks like, like if I go to e-prognosis, like a prognostic index, like it has all these things that are associated with bad things and they're calling it frailty. Uh, I think is the accumulation of deficits model, or is there another word that people use for that? So I I think your description is a fair one. Uh, what I've been trying to understand in my collaborators is 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 what we think is a distinct physiologic process that underpins this phenotype. What you're talking about is something that is also carrying the name of frailty, whether that matches. What, what it's indicating or not, I guess, that is for the viewer to decide, but is really derives from what we as geriatricians do in creating a problem list, right? <laughs> so you have a clinical problem list and they're counting up the numbers of problems on that list and demonstrating that if people have a lot of problems, they're probably going to have some poor outcomes. Now, the poor outcome that that problem list has been tied to is mortality. And, you know, as a clinician, that doesn't surprise me that if you have a lot of bad problems, your mortality risk goes up. Uh, just knowing that someone has congestive heart failure, you know they have a five-year five mortality rate associated with that. So that's not so good uh, in itself. And you add in a few other problems and, and probably they're not going to help out the mortalities. Is that frailty? I personally, not personally, I would, as a scientist, call that multimorbidity. As a clinician, I would call that a marker of multimorbidity. But, but there's a wide variation in what people put into the problem list. Some people put their clinical diagnoses. Some people, some clinicians put in the self-reported concerns. Some people add in their lab values. Some people put in their uh, health, health behaviors. Yes, no, poor, good. Um, you know, so, and what you'll find is that there's high variation from one person's problem list to another. And that actually comes out just as you were suggesting, Eric, in a lot of reports in publications. 
there are many things that predict the same bad outcomes. You are so just made that point. You know, lots of different things predict whether somebody's at risk of mortality, of dying. Um, that doesn't mean mean that they are the same clinically. You know, if you die from, if you're at high risk of cancer mortality in five years and high risk of congestive heart failure mortality in five years, I would venture to guess that the treatment would be different. Yeah. And I think from, correct me if I'm wrong. So the, your definition of, of frailty, you know, the, this phenotypic definition associated with a lot of bad outcomes. So falls, fractures, hospitalizations, um, mortality, mm-hmm. disability. And I, I want to go back to a point that you said is frailty is, is not like disability. They're two different things. We actually just had a podcast about capable study and talked a lot about what disability is and this there's mismatch between what somebody can do and what their environment is. Do you want to talk a little bit more kind of how you think about like frailty and disability? Sure. I'd be pleased to. So there are a lot of ways to talk about it. Um, first of all, I, I think that we have shown over the years that the likelihood of disability increases with age, but its causes clinically are a lot of chronic diseases, which have different fingerprints, if you will, on the kinds of disabilities they cause. Uh, to be obvious, uh, bad osteoarthritis of the knees is going to cause one kind of disability in mobility, and uh, a stroke may cause a very different kind of disability. Uh, If you have both and disability from each, the compromised function that might result from the interplay of both kinds of disability could escalate um, the severity of the outcomes. So chronic diseases have very distinct fingerprints on function, and they are major risk factors for disability. We also have have shown over the years that frailty distinct from chronic diseases causes disability. And here I'm talking about um, understanding what I think we've learned, at least this definition of frailty is, um, which is that when people have three, four, or five of the five phenotypic criteria, what they have deeply diminished physiologic function in a way that compromises their reserves, their resilience, and their ability to maintain homeostasis. And because of those, their ability to bounce back from different kinds of insults. Those decreased reserves also contribute to function and disability. And in fact, what I and my colleagues have shown and many others have shown over the years is that someone who's frail who goes into the hospital is at very high risk of coming out more functionally compromised, more disabled that they came in compared to someone who goes into the hospital and isn't frail. Anyway, so I'll, I'll stop there, but, but they are causally related, but not the same. So in a way, um, you know, I'm just thinking one way to think about it is you can have somebody who's frail, but if they don't have any stressors, they're not going to have any disability from that. But if you start putting stressors on them, for example, like a hospitalization, um, then things start falling apart. Um, well, I, I wanted to build on this precise point here yeah, and ask yeah. about resilience. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you mentioned this word just now. And uh, George Cushell has this wonderful image, which Eric and I are quite partial to because he explains uh, a phenotypic frailty, what he calls stochastic frailty or the deficit accumulation model and resilience as related but distinct concepts and the conceptual model he uses, this is why Eric and I love this, is the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> and um, he talks about uh, phenotypic frailty being lost of the major supports, the pillars, right? Or the major cable that runs along. And stochastic frailty as uh, loss of those little support cables that run up and down between the main cable and support the bridge. You know, those individual little 
pieces. And then resilience as a measure of stress. Oh, Eric's pulled it up for those of you who are watching on YouTube. And we'll have a link to it in the show notes associated with this um, with this podcast. Uh, you know, stress is in the case of the Golden Gate Bridge, like wind, traffic, water. And in the case of an older adult, as we just discussed, hospitalization, or it could be chemotherapy. Uh, and that these are each um, related and distinct um, conceptually. And they also have different uses uh, clinically. Uh, interested in your thoughts and reflections. This is what I use when I'm teaching about frailty and resilience and the relationship between these different models. Interested in your reflections on this. So conceptually, I think this is um, very useful. I guess I would add some additional thoughts that I actually think that phenotypic frailty is what happens when resilience diminishes past a threshold level and the person's physiologic function sinks to a, a different level. And it is a product of the unraveling of resilience. And when that reaches a threshold, a person emerges as, as frail. So resilience is a, uh... Uh, once uh, the relationship between resilience and frailty is that um, once a person passes some threshold, they are no longer able to withstand the stressors and they become frail. So that's what our data would suggest. And um, you could think about it as the unraveling of the body's ability to maintain homeostasis and that, that kind of resilience it's not tied to a single organ system. It's not tied to a single disease. It's our core vitality as, as an organism that is built on robustness and resilience, uh, which actually has a lot to do with the structure of that bridge <laughs> and, yeah. and the fact that it doesn't collapse. Mm -hmm. and, and I have come to think about frailty as one over resilience. I hope that communicates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested also in your thoughts about, uh, so as Eric mentioned, there's been an explosion in frailty research in large part due to your incredible research and groundbreaking work in this area. Um, you know, as I, I took over, it started as executive editor, shouldn't say took over. <laughs> it sounds like a hostile takeover. Started as executive editor at JAGS in January. And I would agree that the most common submission topic is frailty. And I wonder what you think about this explosion in frailty uh, research and thinking about, you know, some contemporaries who are uh, building some successful careers. I'm thinking of Day Kim, who's at Harvard who's developed a frailty model um, that can be derived from Medicare claims. Um, and, uh, you know, other people who are assessing frailty clinically um, as predictors of COVID mortality among older adults. Um, wh where do you see, what, what is your take on the current landscape and multiple uh, applications of frailty for older adults? So I think it's fabulous. Uh, <laughs> Um, I think that it, it is consistent with what I was taught when I was in training to be a geriatrician, which is that frailty is the raison d'etre of geriatric medicine and the heart of the problem that we're trying to solve for. I think that the challenge for the field is how to be meticulous about the concept that we're interrogating and communicating so that we each understand. You can put the same name on a million things mm. and, and that may or may, and that generally doesn't past a certain point in the field help us advance. Mary Tonetti struggled with that in doing falls research that, you know, how do you, how do you even define a fall? Now that was 20 years ago, but it required coming to some agreement at a point about what we, what we all mean when we're saying this. Conceptually, what I have learned is that frailty and, and disease are two levels of health. Frailty is about our, our intrinsic vitality and homeostatic capabilities and reserves and resilience. And what happens when with aging, too much of that diminishes and we lose our bounce back ability, basically. 
Right. Disease is another level of health or ill health that is superimposed on that background vitality. Mm -hmm. And they affect each other. There's no question about it. But they are, to me, they are not the same. And if we can distinguish those, then I think if we agree that that distinction is valid, that's step one. Mm -hmm. Uh, There may be good reason for people to disagree. Um, but if if we find the right distinctions in terms of the processes that affect aging itself and that affect health, then we can at least know which which ones we're talking about with the same label. And you know, there may be a point when we give them different labels. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask also, uh, you know, we just, as we mentioned, uh, we had a, a podcast with one of your um, former mentees, uh, Sarah Zanton, and she was optimistic that the times they are a changing and that, in fact, uh, we will have a CMS mandated assessment of function, payment uh, for services um, to help people age in place in their homes. And I wonder where frailty fits into this. Where should it be assessed clinically? As I'm thinking of our audience of clinicians here. Um, and how can they intervene on it? I, I think of frailty, you know, given your conceptual framework, as more of a like hypertension, right? People don't get symptoms from hypertension generally, unless it's you know quite high. Yeah. But it certainly leads to bad outcomes, right? And we should treat it. Similarly, uh, you know, where should we be assessing frailty, and how should clinicians be treating it? And that, that's my last question. So uh, there was an international consensus conference which published a report in 2013 that said absolutely that clinicians should be screening for frailty for everyone over 70. I agree. Did Um, they say how? Well, they ducked that a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Because I got to say, probably most people... Mo- even most geriatricians, they don't. They're not assessing grip strength. They don't have like one of those hand dynamometers. Uh, right. It would be great if they were assessing walking speed, but I'm not sure how often that's happening. There are places that do it routinely. Um, certainly, my old division at Hopkins does. <laughs> yeah, um, I can imagine. <laughs> but uh, but it you know, it is possible to set that up well and 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 easily so that. Non clinician providers do the and initial screening. How long does a frailty assessment actually like if you were going to do the frailty assessment, including like physical activity, um, slow walking speed, like what time do, commitment? I, it's a five minute time commitment for screening plus a, a self administered questionnaire. Yeah. Um, so feasible. I, it's from my point of view, feasible. I think the the next question is what to do with it. And I think there are several approaches to that. One is that prevention really matters. And at the least, I think prescriptions so that people who are at risk of frailty uh, or are progressing in terms of showing early signs are engaged in physical activity programs to maintain strength and muscle mass and function really important. And for, and physical activity um, is like the magic pill uh, as a model for, for what happens in the diminution of resilience because it improves. It's like taking your car in for a tune-up and every single thing gets fixed. Physical activity improves every dimension of what goes wrong in frailty. From upregulating mitochondrial function to improving, lowering inflammation to improving strength. So that's a winner. Um, diet, important with physical activity, not so successful by itself. And then we need to talk about treatment and certainly ruling out uh, diseases that could contribute to frailty and treating them well effectively is, is important distinguishing what's a disease process from what's a true frailty process uh, matters. But then I think frailty is really critical to understand in the context of moments of risk. So if you're putting somebody in the hospital for um, elective surgery or uh, for non-elective reasons, how we go about protecting them from functional decline, how we assure that they are not immobilized, 
unnecessarily, how we try and maintain strength and diet and nutrition, um, and then what our expectations are for physical activity and rehabilitation, all I think are affected by whether somebody is frail or at risk of being frail. It's going to take longer to bounce back for a person who's frail, but they, unless they have four or five of the frailty criteria, they should be able to bounce back. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of literature, uh, especially around like prehab and surgery, prehab for surgery. And it, the mm-hmm. surgeons seem to really love frailty right now. Mm-hmm highlighting that that that's a great place to potentially target uh, assessing for frailty and then deciding what do we want to do about it to either improve those surgical outcomes to think about you know does this elective surgery make sense or even to think about okay what if things go wrong let's do some advanced care planning um, and i think we need new real medical care support systems in hospital and after hospital yeah. and better rehab approaches for people who are frail. Yeah. I guess my last question for you too is, you know, it, it sounds like it's not just a, a zero or a one. Like you're, it's not um, off or on or about frailty, that there is a continuum. Mm-hmm. A, a red, like, yeah, like you have your, your pre-frail components, you have your, your frail, so those people who are scoring more than three. And then you mentioned four to five, kind of this. Mm-hmm. Tell me more about that, that four to five on that, the, the, the marker of those, those five phenotypic traits? So um, this week, Chen Li Zhu published an article that actually explicates exactly what's going on. But people who have four and particularly five frailty criteria are really very high risk of, short ter- of mortality in the short term, the next six months. Particularly those with five criteria are at a falling off point. And really, it would appear in a pre-death phase. And that's and their mortality risks are quite different than those who have three frailty criteria. People with three frailty criteria are less likely, uh, and Tom Gill showed this a number of years ago, to, to revert back to fewer, less likely than people who have two. Yeah. But but they're different in terms of their mort- their mortality risk is not as imminent as yeah. those four and particularly five. It's almost like end stage frailty, what we're dealing with there. Right. And it's fair. If you look at Chen Li's elegant article, um, you'll see uh, it's a breathtaking difference. Well, we'll have a a link to that. Um, I want to end. I know we're running out of time, but um, if you had a magic wand, you can fix one thing in the healthcare system around frailty. What thing would you do right now? I would make it so that frail older adults could have rehab for three times longer than Medicare pays for. I love the specifics on that. Well, Linda, times are changing. And before we end, maybe we can hear a little bit more. So hopefully that little magic wand will work. Alex? It is drawn, the cursed it is cast The slow one now will later be last As the present now will later be past The order is rapidly fading And the first one now will later be last For the times they are a change Thank you, Linda. That was wonderful. I learned a lot and uh, I think I got a better hold in my head of it as far as the concept of frailty. So uh, thank you and thank you for everything that you've done for so geriatrics in the field. Thank you uh, so much. This was a joy. And a big thank you, Archstone Foundation, for your continued support. And to all of our listeners, have a wonderful night. <laughs>